He texts me every day when he, you know, gets to work. He texts me when he's coming home. I want to know what happened after he left work at 10 o'clock. Where did he go? Uh, how was the car found? That was Yahaira Hernandez, the mother of missing person Juan Hernandez. And she was only scratching the surface in terms of the questions raised around this case. We're going to look into the investigation so far. We're going to see what types of stopping gaps Yahaira and her family have been bumping into and how they've been trying to work around those. But most importantly, we're going to turn on the searchlight for Juan Hernandez. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorton. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do, and thank you for helping me share these videos and raise exposure for these cases. This is the young man that we are looking for today, Juan Hernandez. I can tell you just looking into his backstory, this is someone that has a very bright future ahead of him. This is someone that does a lot for his community, uh, someone that just it's heartbreaking to know is missing and his family is dealing with this for coming up on two months now. Uh, let's go ahead and start at NamUs and see what we can learn about this case. Juan Carlos Hernandez, a male Hispanic, date of last contact, September 22nd, 2020. We're going to see there's a little bit of kind of misinformation that kicks out from the LAPD about his date of last contact, but we'll get to that. He is missing from Los Angeles, California at the age of 21, would currently be 22. Um, we're going to bump into some news stories. Essentially, it was his birthday just a few weeks ago, and of course, his family didn't have him around for that. Uh, his nickname is Cookie, and he is a male standing at six foot two, weighing 215 pounds. For the circumstances of disappearance, Juan Carlos Hernandez was last seen on September 22nd in Los Angeles. His vehicle was located in Los Angeles two days later. No sign of Juan. There's a few more details we're going to add to our understanding of that as we go along. Black hair, brown eyes. We do have pretty good clothing description. Uh, first of all, a light gray backpack, a Vans t-shirt with a white 66 on the back, light colored shorts, black and white checkered socks. He does wear glasses, and he also wears a red religious bracelet. Unfortunately, I haven't bumped in any pictures of that bracelet yet. Here at NamUs, they only have two photos of him. One of them is the photo we showed at the start of this video. Of course, contact information for this case will be in the description box below as well. But let's start getting into the details here at patch.com. The family of Juan Hernandez is asking for the public's help in finding him after the 21-year-old did not come home from work Tuesday night. Hernandez was last seen Tuesday at 10 p.m. driving a 2020 Honda Civic near Western Avenue and 81st Street. So uh, Juan, apparently, as many people, uh, lost his job when the virus pandemic started and he had to find new work. Uh, of course, we know marijuana is legal in the state of California, and he decided to go to work for a dispensary. We're going to bump into some information about this particular dispensary as we're looking into today's case. Um, but that dispensary is where he was last seen. It is at 8113 Southwestern Avenue. Uh, from the NamUs profile, we know his vehicle is found. It's found approximately three miles away over here at South Figueroa and West 64th. Um, it was also found a couple days later, and there's some other conditions about it we're going to discuss that raise more questions as well. The dispensary that he's working at or was working at is called VIP Collective. And in an interesting twist, there's some comments here on Yelp about the search for him and how helpful or unhelpful VIP Collective might be being in that search. Uh, here is a look at the exterior of the building. Uh, very nondescript, as you can see, uh, just a dark building with literally the address, page 
painted on it. Um, but if you do zoom in on it here, you can see there's a little sign. I don't know if they pull this sign out when they're open or not, or if it just sits there for people that are walking in, but it's talking about kind of their, their daily specials and stuff like that. Uh, continuing over at abc7.com, his mother, Yahira Hernandez, started to worry after she didn't hear from him after work that night. He texts me every day when he gets to work. He texts me when he's coming home, she said. It's not like him to not come home and sleep. It's not like him to not reach out. He just started a job at a marijuana dispensary after being laid off from his previous job due to the coronavirus pandemic. Juan's aunt, Stephanie Mendoza, says Juan is a marathon runner who's close to his family and who hasn't ever had any issues before this. This is not in his character. My nephew is very responsible and he's very humble, she said. My biggest fear is that my nephew is dead or lost, Mendoza said. Very, very big concerns. Uh, obviously, when you're talking about a case and it's been nearly two months, you have to consider those possibilities as well. But there's also some strange messages we're going to see in terms of how the LAPD is handling this that actually raise those concerns for me personally. But uh, continuing with another article at patch.com, Juan Hernandez search enters second week. Juan has been missing since Tuesday night. Uh, that was September 22nd, going by the name as date. And then on Thursday, which I believe is the 24th, Juan's car was discovered abandoned near Figueroa Street and 64th Street. Onlookers said the car had been idling for hours without anyone inside. So the engine actually running. Um, and from what I understand, it's an alley it's found in. And I believe it's local uh, sex workers that notice that the car has been left there and has been running this entire time. Uh, something else interesting about that, his mother has been contributing information. I'm in contact with her as well. Uh, but on Web Sleuths, she's sharing a lot of information. And one of the things she shared there is the key. This is actually a car that just starts with a fob. The key fob was not in the vehicle. Uh, so it seems like Juan and the keys somehow exited the vehicle, but the car was running at the time and it didn't shut itself off when the fob left the vehicle. Continuing over at LAPD Online, and here's where we get into a little of the confusion that I mentioned before. In an early post there, they said Juan was last seen on September 26th near the 3200 block of West Adams Boulevard in Los Angeles. Now, I've seen the family comment that they don't they don't know where that information is coming from, but that's not accurate, that he was last seen at work. I have no idea how something like this would get posted from the LAPD unless they had some type of tip or some form of information that came in that stated that. And it might have been a false sighting. I mean, that does happen in missing persons cases. Maybe they had a tip called in that someone was like, no, I just saw one and he was over here and it was on September 26th. They have since kind of rolled back on that. There's an update to this same posting that's saying Juan was actually last seen on September 22nd, 2020, around 3 p.m. But that raises questions too, because that's still not fitting with the story that we've been hearing. The, the main story is Juan was last seen by people at the, at the dispensary he works for, by the security team in particular, at 10 o'clock at night, and he was leaving to go home. So either LAPD isn't considering that or LAPD might not be trusting the information coming from the dispensary any further. Uh, the three o'clock sighting is actually some personal friends of Juan's that he saw before he went to work that day. So is the LAPD looking at the dispensary? I, I don't know. There's just It's very strange to me. I don't see this very often in missing persons cases where you have kind of a complete incorrect date, uh, which doesn't make sense. I mean, his car is found two days before this. The location doesn't tie into anything else in terms of the media that's out there about where he would be. Um, but then they kind of retract that and say, no, it was actually September 22nd at around three. But it's interesting because they're saying at the block of where his work was. So I, I just, I don't know, um, kind of confused by the messaging that's being put out by the LAPD, but it does make me wonder if they're not considering the information from the dispensary as extremely solid. LA Times did a very good article on this, so we're going to lean on this a little bit more, especially to understand Juan. The 21-year-old is a student at El Camino College with a semester left to go before transferring to USC, 
where he plans to study engineering. I believe his, uh, I think his brother graduated from USC also. He has played sports since before college and teammates and other friends have taken to posting on social media in the hopes of getting information about his whereabouts. And there's a picture of him with his mother. Detective O. Cancino of the LAPD's missing persons unit said Thursday that the case has been moved to the department's robbery homicide unit. Talk about things that I don't see in missing persons cases very often. This one, extremely strange. For it to move to robbery and homicide uh, within a matter of days of when this missing persons investigation is started, definitely not a good sign. And the concerns that his aunt were talking about, for me, get severely escalated when you hear something like this. They took over the investigation pretty much the next day because of the suspicious circumstances surrounding the disappearance, said the detective. At Missing Persons, we don't handle anything criminal, he said. Once there's a criminal aspect to the investigation, it's going to go to a detective division that handles the criminal aspect of it. Please remember this quote for me because we're going to bump into some information later that makes it sound like this quote never happened. Uh, Hernandez said her son was called Cookie by friends and family. He didn't have a car. When he was last seen, he was driving a 2020 Honda Civic he had borrowed from his mother. Two of his best friends saw him just before 3 p.m. when his work shift at a marijuana dispensary started. A few minutes before his shift ended, around 10 p.m., he sent a text message telling his mother he would see her at home. But early the next morning, about 5.30 a.m., she noticed he wasn't around when she went outside. The car was not there. Of course, she tried to call him. Quote, all of my calls went to his voicemail, she said. When Hernandez called his workplace, a security guard told her that her son had left just after 10 p.m. like the other employees. The car, when it was found, was intact. Uh, his mother was surprised by that. She said money that she had left inside the car was still there. Uh, as a matter of fact, it seems like everything was in the car except for things that belonged specifically to her son. Her quote is, there was no sign that my son had even been driving it. She described her son as a homebody who likes to sit covered in a blanket and play League of Legends online with his friends. She said that he also likes to jog and that he was in the 10th, when he was in the 10th grade, he ran in his first marathon. He spent six years studying robotics in the Neighborhood Academic Initiative Program, which was run by USC. He was always very attentive, careful, always supporting me in whatever I needed, she said. She said that since he disappeared, friends and family members have come together, including from other states, to help search for her son. Keep searching. Keep sharing his photos on social media, his mother said. To Juan, I want to say I will not give up. I will be strong and I will do everything I can to find you. And uh, if you're not convinced of that yet, wait till the time we hit the end of, the, of this episode. I think you're going to absolutely be in agreement with her. This is a woman that is working extremely hard. This is a family that's working hard and rallying a community around them. As a matter of fact, at this next article, it literally says that over at abc7.com, an article from October 5th, a local community is rallying to support the family. It's like he vanished into thin air. We have absolutely no news whatsoever, said his mother. We haven't heard any information in regards to Juan, either through social media, his financial information. Nothing's been used. His best friends and close friends haven't heard anything. Volunteers gathered at the park for another day of searching and posting flyers. Uh, I believe this was at uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Park. Uh, close to the area. And from what his mother tells me, um, I think they have put out like 15,000 flyers at this point. Very, very big effort that's going on. And she's also, she's pressing on all fronts. We're going to see there's other things going on around this case as well. Uh, I also want to call out that we have, I believe this is the student publication for El Camino College, the college that he was attending. It's called The Union. And I want to call out that of all the articles I'm bumping into this uh, with this case, the LA Times one was was a good article, but they're really going above and beyond at the union uh, for sharing information about the story, for digging into the details of this story. They're doing very, very good work. Uh, makes me feel really good for the future of journalism to see things like this. It's been a horrible past number of days. I'm not sleeping. I'm not eating. 
His family's so distraught, Yahira Hernandez said. Following her sister's advice, Yahira began filling out a missing persons report that same day. She said LAPD was initially resistant to open an investigation on her son's disappearance, implying he'd run away and had no obligation to stay in contact with her. Uh, you know, you guys know that I don't like getting down on law enforcement too much, but it's just really frustrating looking into case after case like this and hearing that people are going to file a missing persons report and there's always pushback. Seems like in 95% of the cases that I look into, I hear about this aspect and I don't know why. Is it really that hard? Like we're talking about taking a report. We're talking about some little paperwork. I understand that a huge percentage of these cases are going to be solved within a matter of days. I understand a lot of these cases are going to be solved without law enforcement doing anything. I get that, but not every one. Sometimes you get these cases and for families to have trouble just getting that report filed, it's just tough, especially when you're talking about a case where her vehicle is missing, not his vehicle, her vehicle is missing. They should have instantly taken this with no problems. And I'm not saying, you know, this isn't, that's not a slam against all of law enforcement or even all of the LAPD. The person that she was interfacing with on that particular instance, I don't think that they were doing a great job by, by putting any roadblocks in terms of them getting that filed. Uh, that vehicle is a 2020 brand new vehicle, goes missing with her son. If you don't want to take it as a missing persons report, take it as a stolen vehicle report. Just take a report. I just... I'm, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated because you're going to see where it goes in terms of some of the comments and some of the back and forth that's happening around this case. And I always, when I talk to families directly, I'm always sure to really touch on the aspect of, hey, look, it's going to be a tough relationship with law enforcement, but you got to do your best with it because you might get to a point where you really, really need them. And when you have a case like this where you've got a homicide and robbery division that's looking into it, the, the chances that you're going to need cooperation with law enforcement at a later date are maybe higher than usual for a typical missing persons case. Back to the information. The car was found still running with no damage. Sex workers in the area reported the vehicle had been abandoned for hours before police arrived. All of my sister's personal belongings, money, jewelry, devices were inside. Being that it's a new car, it's odd because in that area, it's really hot. It's known for prostitution. It's also known for bad activities and also to drop off cars, Stephanie Mendoza, Yahira's sister, said. My car was in mint condition, said his mother. I usually leave my work stuff in the car. I had money in there. I had my Fitbit watch. I mean, everything was in place. However, there was no sign of Juan. His cell phone wasn't there. His wallet wasn't there. Nothing was there. It's like he never drove my car. She also shared some information about the cell phone. Um, I believe he was on a family plan with her. Uh, pretty much the only information that she could get from the company at this time is that either the phone was shut off or the SIM card was removed, but it just has not touched the network since. Juan Carlos Hernandez's aunt visited VIP Collective, the dispensary he was employed at, the day after he disappeared, but said the workers were unhelpful. When she asked about their security camera footage, which obviously a dispensary, you've got a lot of money and product. I mean, a few a few years ago, uh, this was an illegal drug trade that was going on there. Huge amounts of money pushing through selling marijuana in the Los Angeles area. And then the medicinal thing kicked in. And then you had a lot of these collectives spring up. But who do you think was running them? There's still a ton of money that runs through these places. They're going to have not just bodyguards on site, which we know from this story, this location certainly had as well, but they're going to have security cameras. So what happened with the footage? They told her it deleted itself after 24 hours. I don't know if that's reasonable to believe. Um, having worked in retail before, back in the 1990s, we had a 30 day rotation for the store that I was managing. And it's not just because you might have something that happens 
outside a fight breaks out or something, you might need to use that footage and give it to the police. It's because you might also need the cameras from inside. You might need to be watching your own employees. What if they're stealing product or stealing money? You think you're going to be able to figure that out and then within 24 hours, go and grab the tapes and make sure that you save a copy off or something like that. But then even outside of that, she's there the next day. I'm sure that they were contacted fairly quickly. Did, did they not know about this within the 24 hour period? They couldn't have gone and done whatever they have to do to save that record off the system. Um, it was 10 o'clock at night. They supposedly last saw him. And if she's there the next day, I think that means there's a number of hours still before they hit that 10 o'clock, 24 hour automatic deletion that supposedly happens. The union attempted to contact VIP Collective LA over the phone three times, but every call and voicemail went unanswered. Well, the union, uh, by putting out that information, might have started a little headache for VIP Collective LA. Here is their Yelp page again, and you can see the last three reviews, uh, one from October, two from November, everyone giving it one star. And in particular, here's a comment, a young man who worked here has gone missing and no one at the business seems to care or wants to help out. The security footage magically erases after 24 hours. Um, and basically each of these comments is the same along those lines. People are very upset at this aspect that 24 hours and all of a sudden the footage disappears. And is there something else going on around this story that's tied to that particular location, I think is a, a strong thing to consider. Over at foxla.com, the Los Angeles City Council voted on an emergency motion on Tuesday to try to raise $50,000 in reward money for credible information that leads to the whereabouts of Juan Carlos Hernandez. So thankfully, and I'm sure this is in no doubt tied to um, his mother's efforts, his family's efforts, and how close his family is to the community. I mean, this is a woman that for her birthday decided she was going to go out and help the local homeless by giving them meals and supplies. Um, somehow, Councilman Herb Wesson gets wind of this and files an emergency motion. Juan's mother attended the city council meeting remotely and pleaded for the public's help in trying to find her missing son. Quote, I just urge you to put yourself in my shoes. Juan's a good kid. He was trying his best to survive, especially during the pandemic. Now here's, remember that thing I asked you to remember earlier? Because Juan Carlos's appearance is not yet considered a criminal investigation, Wesson said state law prohibits the city council from offering a reward using public funds. Hold on a second, because the detective from that article several weeks before this said that it was handed over to robbery and homicide specifically because it became a criminal matter. Now we're hitting, hearing from city council, oh wait, this is a missing persons case? That's not a criminal matter. That is kind of odd. I'm thankful that Wesson is still pushing around this. I mean, essentially, uh, you know, he is filing an emergency motion to try to get that money together. But them having that belief that, yeah, we can't do it that way because it's not a criminal investigation. When you have LAPD saying we're bumping this over into the criminal investigation unit, really frustrating, doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm sure is uh, just wrecking the family in terms of them looking for help, feeling like they're close to getting something and then hearing kind of an excuse that really doesn't line up with the information that's coming out about this. But thankfully, we do have Wesson still trying to help. His district office has set up a community benefits fund with the goal of raising the $50,000, and members of the legal cannabis industry have stepped up to contribute to it. That's another aspect I've been thinking about. You're thinking about a business uh, where an employee has gone missing. I'm not finding any articles about that particular business offering a, don a reward of some kind or a donation to a reward fund. Just another thing that's a little strange about this, uh, especially for, you know, if you want your community to come and support your business, you want to show that you're supporting the community. I can't think of an easier way. 5,000 bucks here. We're going to put $5,000 into the pot for this 50,000 to help find Juan would be a huge statement to the community and to the family. I'm not finding anything like that happening, at least publicly. 
People who want to contribute can mail checks to the Los Angeles City Clerk's Office at 200 North Spring Street with care of the Juan Carlos Hernandez reward written on the memo, Wesson said. Back to another article from the union. As family honors missing student, questions arise on law enforcement and elected officials. For roughly one month, family and friends of Juan Carlos Hernandez, a missing engineering student, have been looking for him with few leads to aid them. Now, they're giving back to the community who has helped them in their search. I just, to know what this family is going through in terms of the hoops that we've been talking about, to know that this is what they go back to, they're helping their community. Basically, they've been talking to homeless people, trying to raise exposure, trying to ask them if they've seen Juan. And then they said, you know what? There's a special day that's coming up. Uh, we're going to give back to the homeless once again. On Thursday, October 15th, around noon, on the corner of San Pedro and 7th Street, the Hernandez family, along with friends and volunteers, set up tables and organized an assembly line to feed the homeless community in the Skid Row area using some of the funds they received in their GoFundMe. The Hernandez family worked fast and strategically, turning towers of, car of cardboard boxes into an orderly line of free supplies while a line patiently formed on the side. A banner printed with Juan Carlos Hernandez's missing persons flyer hung from the main tent with a smaller foam balloon banner beneath it reading, Happy Birthday. The special day that they were out there to celebrate was Juan Carlos Hernandez's 22nd birthday on October 15th. Juan was really involved in multiple running communities within downtown that would run one day a week. They didn't just run together, but they performed community services together, his brother, Joseph Hernandez, said. Uh, and here you can see they, they've literally put a bag together. Uh, they're considering it kind of like a first aid kit with all these different supplies, hand soap, um, fingernail clippers, all kinds of different things that you, people on the street might need. And then in the bag, they have a small flyer with Juan's missing person information on it. It just, it's... It, it's such a good idea. And of course, you guys know, I really like highlighting when I see great ideas like this. This family is going above and beyond because they're not just trying to help their own interests. They're helping the people around them that they feel like are helping them. It's just, it's a circle. Um, it's its really amazing to me. I'm, I'm really just so moved by this. Prior to the distribution event, Yahira Hernandez was tired of being left without answers by the LAPD. She said she took her demands to local elected officials and then, of course, was told that uh, it's not a criminal investigation, so they can't just offer a reward. Uh, Yahira Hernandez said discrepancies in information regarding her son's case have left her frustrated. Boy, I mean, just for me to feel what I've been feeling looking into this and knowing she's living in, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis with this stuff. Uh, Yahira, I, I really, really feel for you. She wishes local politicians would honor their word of serving the people by doing more to help find her son. I'm the people, she said. Wands the people. Wands the community. It's very, very true. Yahira Hernandez said that LAPD has also declined to update her family on anything involving the case. She told me that too. Has that, that certainly hasn't changed. LAPD has visited VIP Collective LA, the cannabis dispensary Juan Carlos Hernandez worked at, multiple times at least a little bit of hope in hearing that i mean at least we know that there is an investigation going on they're going to the last place he was known to be at and conducting their investigation there that makes sense i'm kind of curious why some of that information isn't coming back to the family uh directly from lapd but uh that that appears to be what's happening Alex Traverso, a spokesman for the Bureau of Cannabis Control, BCC, confirmed VIP Collective LA is currently operating without the proper state licensing. Therefore, the dispensary is considered illegal. Traverso said it does not mean VIP Collective LA isn't currently waiting for a license or plans to apply for one. I would think at this point, I mean, I know there was a lot of strangeness when it was in this kind of gray zone of medicinal dispensaries and all that. But now with the full legalization that's pretty much happened out there, shouldn't they start cracking down on illegal dispensaries at some point like this? It just, I, I don't understand how you can operate a business without a license of that nature out there. 
Uh, the legal repercussions for operating an illegal cannabis retailer depend on the exact situation at each location as well as whether the district attorney decides to charge the offenders. In my experience, it's been very difficult to bring charges against anybody because it's very hard to find the owner at times, Traverso said. Uh, yeah, I don't know. And of course they got another shot of it here. And I do think, I just want you guys to notice in this picture, the, uh, gate that locks up the front has actually been pulled off and pulled down. That might relate to some information that we have. I don't know if that's just, if this just happens to be this way, but, um, Juan's mother says in some information at web sleuths here, let's just jump to it real quick. Uh, last week, there was a news report showing law enforcement going into the business and tearing the door down. I have no information yet on why they confiscated, uh, what they confiscated from the employer's shop. So I don't know if that's an actual photo of it. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure, but it seems like they've been there several times. And if she's correct, one of those times might have been uh, with a search warrant or certainly sounds rougher than them just going to speak to people that work there. Exhausted and determined, Yahira Hernandez said she would take further action to ensure both the city and LAPD hear her voice. If I got to protest, then I'm going to go out and protest, she said. And wouldn't you know it, next article, October 26th, 2020, a son has been missing for 34 days. His family demands answers. And here we have a picture of Juan's mother and family holding signs saying, bring Juan home. It took less than a day for his mother, Yahira Hernandez, to know something was suspicious. But after relentless search efforts throughout the city and as far as the Inland Empire, nothing has turned up what might finally bring the close-knit family back together. His abandoned car was found idling in an alley without his phone, wallet, sweater, or backpack. So now we we have a pretty strong list there of the actual items that are missing. And that's what she meant by her stuff was all in there, including money that she had left in there. But anything related to Juan was not in the vehicle. And it does make me wonder, it makes me wonder about the possibility of a carjacking situation or something like that, of him being stopped before he gets to the vehicle. Um... I don't know. I don't know. It, it's a big question of actually, was he actually in the vehicle at some point uh, after work? No fingerprints or other leads were found in his empty car, which the family says was yet another example of LAPD's incredibly unhelpful response throughout the ordeal. One of the other things that um, she told me was they never really took it in as evidence, so they didn't do any testing of, of that nature. It's overwhelming that as a family, we're going through this and then having to beg LAPD for help, his mother said. Even now, they don't take me seriously. I call them and all they say is, we're looking into it, we're investigating. On Sunday, the family held a protest in downtown Los Angeles to continue bringing awareness to the case. After gathering at City Hall, the group marched around LAPD headquarters before convening outside the entrance to ask for accountability from the ones with the tools to help. Rather than being an asset in the search, Juan's mother says communicating with LAPD has been another job in itself and one that has reaped few benefits. They have the manpower for search warrants, video surveillance, to do all the stuff that we can't, she said. We should be working together, not against each other. I feel like they're not working with us. The family is beginning to search for a private investigator. From what I can see, this family is doing everything they can and everything right in terms of trying to get this investigation going. Public demonstration like that, if you're not hearing from the law enforcement you're dealing with, what else are you supposed to do? And then the kind of mixed messages that you're hearing from law enforcement, then from city council. I mean, it, it has to be understandable that this family is extremely frustrated. There's also a website that's been put together, helpmefindwan.com. There's a Facebook group that has also been put together around this as well. Of course, I'll have links to all that in the description box down below. But I wanted to share with you a post from Yahira from today. And I actually saw this right before um, I started researching this case. And I knew after I read this, 
that we were going to have to talk about this case on Searchlight today. Today marks another week with no answers in regards of Juan's disappearance. I know his story is slowly fading away little by little. I know that elections and then the holidays will soon be most people's priority. Know that I understand. It's hard to keep up with a story that has no leads. It's especially harder when it's not one of your own loved ones. I'm not upset, maybe a bit sad, but I totally get it. Juan, know that I won't forget. I won't give up. I'm still making phone calls. I'm still sharing your story. I'm still doing all I can on my side for you, mijo. I'm still hurting and praying for your return. I will stand here strong for you and your brothers. I won't give up hope. I won't stop. I pray that you're okay. I pray for our Lord to heal the pain inside this family and friends. I pray that he continues to give us hope and determination to endure this and anything else that comes our way. Uh, Yahira, um, I know you're right that a lot of stories like this do fade away and the world kind of seemingly keeps going except for the families that are facing this. But I want you to know, uh, not only am I here and am, am I caring about this story now, um, so are thousands of other people that are going to see this video and are going to help me share and raise exposure to this case again. And I hope that that exposure can help in a few ways. I hope we get pictures of Juan out there so people can know who we're looking for. We can get the details about Juan out there. Six foot two, 215 pounds, gray hoodie, white shorts, black vans, last seen at Western and 81st. But I hope that maybe also with the additional people seeing, maybe more people are going to send some letters to city council. Maybe family members of people that work in LEPD are going to mention, hey, do you know about that case? Do you know about what that family's going through? I hope that it helps in, in all the different ways that this case really deserves. And I do hope that Juan comes home in whatever form that means for you and your family. You deserve to have the answers. So there is a GoFundMe. We know the family's already doing amazing things with proceeds from this GoFundMe. Uh, the family, several of them have stopped working because they've kicked into full-time search efforts around this. And like his mother said, I mean, just dealing with the LAPD, that's basically like a full-time effort in itself. But they are planning on trying to find a private investigator. Um, so despite the fact that they have $16,000, a lot of people would say, hey, well, that's, that's a considerable amount of money. You're right, it is. But once you start talking about private investigator fees, retainer, hourly fees, that amount can go very, very quickly. So they're aiming for a $25,000 goal. On behalf of myself and my amazing supporters on PayPal and Patreon, I'm making a donation to them just as soon as I'm done recording today. And this is where I ask for your help with this brain scratchers. What's going on with this case? Let's talk about it in the comments below. As always, I ask that we remain respectful. I know Juan's mother is going to see this video because I'm already in contact with her. And I want to make sure that whatever we're talking about down there is helpful to them and helpful to their efforts. Outside of that, we need help raising exposure to this case. So if you have friends that live in California, around the Los Angeles area, please share this video with them. And if you have information about this case, if you're not sure what to do with it or feel like you can't talk to LAPD about it, in the contact details below, you can contact Crime Stoppers and remain anonymous. That is how that system works. Basically, you call them, you tell them your information. Uh, if you want to be el eligible for the reward, they'll give you a completely randomized number. If you hear that the case does get solved, you call them back, you tell them that number, and you're in for that reward. So if that does help motivate you, please use that information down below and know that there is that $50,000 reward that's being collected as well to help with this case. Um, and if someone that happens to be working at that dispensary sees this video, please do the right thing. Please help this family out. And it might be as simple as just being open to some contact with them about what happened that day. It might be as simple as getting a reasonable explanation for the 24 hour security camera thing, that might be per perfectly understandable, but we don't have the details to understand it. 
But if you have some way to help the family with this too, please consider stepping up. Maybe, maybe it is a few thousand dollars that you put towards that reward fund. Maybe it's something that you do in terms of with the products you're selling, you're dropping in a pamphlet about Juan and each one. There's, there's got to be some things that you can do to help with this if that's really where your heart is. And, and I hope for the people there that, that it is. I, I'm not 100% sure, very hard to tell with what we're looking through the lens of media and seeing, but uh, I don't know. I'm always hoping for the good in people. That's it, Brain Scratchers. Thank you so much for joining me on today's Searchlight. I appreciate each and every one of you. And a big thank you to people that helped me make donations just like we're making today. New patrons, C.A. Bonema. Thank you so much, C.A. Kevin Corbett. Thank you. April Harmon. Little Kittle Cat. Noreen. And Noreen, I'm sorry. I don't know how to say your last name. I'm going to say Guidis, but I don't think that's right. Uh, thank you so much for joining and also locked out increasing their pledge on Patreon. Thank you so much. If you'd like to help support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal or buy merchandise. All of it helps me with making donations like we made today and always having these presentations with limited commercials, no interruptions once the show starts. Um, I really appreciate your help in doing that because I think these messages are too important to be busted up by random commercials. So thank you to all my supporters. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Stay healthy. I'll be back on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch right here on the Lord and Arts channel. 